watching, so if the chair's running late, I I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and until uh, Representative Chesa Tangeman arrives, or not, um, we're going to begin the meeting. Um, first item on the agenda is to review and approve the minutes of October 31st. Is there a motion? So move to approve them, please. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay, and the minutes have been approved. Um, first item on the agenda, 19P60, Agency of Human Services Medically Complex Nursing Services. For um, we have four witnesses, and I would call first uh, Linda McLemore and anyone who she might wish to bring with her to testify. And while the, the witness is coming forward, um, the committee will please introduce itself. Uh, good morning, <clears throat> Senator Jenny Lyons, representing Trenton County. Uh, Re Representative Trevor Squirrel, uh, representing Jericho and Underhill. Representative Marsha Gardner from Richmond. Uh, Senator Mark McDonald from Orange County. <clears throat> At the NRS Committee Council. Joel Benninger from Caledonia County. Linda Myers from Essex Town. Representative Robin Chestnut. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> you, couldn't have, you couldn't have arrived at a more auspicious time. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the first witness on the first bill before us has taken their seats. And will you identify yourselves for the record, please? My name is Linda Narrow-McLemore. I'm a staff attorney with AHS, and I work in the Medicaid Policy Unit. I'm here instead of Ashley Berliner, who's usually here on HR rules. She is on parental leave until March. And I have with me Monica Ogilvie. If you would just explain your relationship to the, the high-tech nursing in the school. My name is Monica Ogilvie. I work at the health department. Um, I'm the director of um, Children with Special Health Needs, which is a program within the Maternal and Child Health Division. And the pediatric uh, portion of the high-tech nursing program, uh, which is um, directed under this rule, falls under our program, whereas the adult uh, administration of the program uh, is under DAP. Like I'm unwrapping <laughs> candy in a movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a treat. Mm. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. So, you have some revisions? Yes. Um, so, I uh, presented this rule along with six others at the last LCAR meeting on October 31st. And since at the last LCAR, I described one revision to. Um, to the committee. Um, would you like me to refresh the committee's memory about that revision? Or? Yes. Please. Okay. All right. The, um, specifically, VLA had um, two concerns about the rule as written. The first concern was that the agency's removal of language from rule that says that case management services are covered. Um, as I testified to on October 31st, uh, the agency proposed a rule revision that states that the agency will continue to cover nurse care plan management and oversight. That revision is consistent with current policy and practice, and we um, talked with Vermont Legal Aid um, regarding this change, and they indicated that that revision addressed their concerns. Thank you. Okay. The second concern was that the rule didn't adequately clarify when a family can, quote, carry forward unused nursing service hours to be used later. The rule is originally written um, was silent on this issue. Uh, last Friday, the agency filed with LCAR a proposed revision to the rule that would address VLA's concern and that re actually reflects agency, the agency's current policy and practice. Um, the at issue is 4.2325B. It current, the, that provision currently says payments for services will not exceed the units authorized. Any unused service units will not be carried forward or used for other services. The revision 
states services are prior authorized annually. Payment for services will not exceed the units are authorized and the unused service units will not be carried forward from prior authorization period to prior authorization period or used for other services. This proposed rule revision um, reflects current policy and practice and it will permit families the flexibility that Vermont Legal Aid has encouraged and we've um, spoken with Vermont Legal Aid and shared this language and they indicated that this would adjust their concerns. I do want to point, say one thing. Um, I want to correct my testimony from last time. I um, testified that carry forward in this way was prohibited by the state plan, which was based upon, I think, a mis information that was mistaken. Um, and it was certainly given in good faith, but when I went back and looked, I, I think it was a wrong interpretation of our state plan that the real prohibition, what CMS won't allow, is for us to let families carry forward nursing hours during a prior authorization period. And we prior authorize for a year. So at the end of that year, they can't carry forward your hours they haven't used. But in terms of week to week, month to month, we have always and continue to allow families the flexibility to do that, especially because there is a real limitation in being able to access nursing services. So my sincere apologies to the committee. Um, is the authorization period a calendar year or a year based on beginning of services? <laughs> Great question. It's from the day that we authorize services. Um, and I, I had another question, but it, it sounds like this is a clarification rather than a change of policy. A clarification That's accurate. Of one. That's accurate. And I think is, the rule was silent, and now the rule will be explicitly clear that the hours can be carried forward mm -hmm. within a prior authorization period. And is that annual um, period in? kind of an irrelevant question at this point. Is that annual period the best way to do it, or is quarterly review? Would that be more efficient, and the annual is, is what we have and what we're capable of administering? That's a great question. Um, so we um, meet with every one of these families at least once a year to review uh, the medical records to see how um, their loved one is doing. So in my case, it's their children. Um, and just to make sure that the number of nursing hours that they've been authorized is actually appropriate, to make sure they don't need more or less the same. And so at that point, um, then we close that loop with their provider team just to make sure we're understanding all the information and make sure we have a complete picture of their medical need. Um, and then at that point, we authorize the services in a in basically a, a, the Medicaid information system, and we authorize them for the full year. If at any point they want us to reevaluate what's been authorized, we can do that at the request of a family or a medical provider. Any further questions? So uh, I'm wondering if the uh, points brought up in the letter from Vermont Legal Aid were all addressed. I noticed that um, there was a question about the definition of medically complex nursing services, and I didn't see where that was particularly addressed in um, your memorandum. Uh, I know we're going to hear from Vermont Legal Aid uh, later on, but just wondering what your thoughts are on that. We do not have any other additional changes to rules based on Vermont Legal Aid's comments. We. Uh, I um, think that the definition is clear, and then prior to last LPAR, um, talked with Vermont Legal Aid, and they specified that their two concerns were the ones that we addressed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no further questions, entertain a motion. No, we did oh, oh, hear from the other two. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> entertain a motion to hear from Vermont Legal Aid. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Rachel Seelig. I'm a staff attorney in the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. Uh, as Ms. McElmore said, uh, we are happy with the two changes that have been put in place. 
uh, we think these kind of protect the flexibility that families need. Um, I also want to be clear, we kind of talked about the bigger picture of this program last time, um, that it, only about half of the hours are actually being able to be used. And the, the updates to the rule aren't going to solve that problem. We hope that they will help with that problem, um, but there's more work to be done. Uh, we've been meeting with Monica and her team uh, for almost a year now. We'll continue to do that, and we're happy to talk with, the, with any of you or any committees further about, about the work that we've been doing. Um, because the families who participate in both the child and adult programs, this is really a, a necessary uh, service that needs to be fully provided uh, for those families. Uh, if I can answer any questions, I'm happy to do so. Are there any questions for this witness? So just to clarify, the two changes that have been presented today um, satisfy the concerns that you expressed in your letter last time? Yes. Good. So with that in mind, um, then it meets legislative intent. And um, I move that we approve the rule as <coughs> modified. Um, just before we do so, I'd like to thank the previous witnesses for correcting their testimony. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, so if there are no further questions, all in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. We have approved the revisions to the uh, rule um, 19P60. Thank you very much. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Allison Bates. I'm special counsel with the Department of Public Service. And I'm Keith Levinson with the department. Kelly Lander, Department of Public Service. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so we are here presenting our revised final proposed rule of the Vermont Residential Building Energy Standards. As the committee probably remembers, at the September 5th Alcar meeting, Alcar objected to the copyright notice um, on our proposed RBS rule. Um, the original rule as proposed uh, was based on the International Energy Conservation Code, or IECC, and the rule as proposed um, integrated that copyrighted IECC material with Vermont specific changes, which were not themselves copyrighted. Um, LCAR objected on a limited basis to that copyright. Um, after reviewing LCAR's objection, as well as the case law, other states' practices, and the record um, on this issue for previous versions of the rule, the department decided to resolve LCAR's objection going forward. And the method that we developed to do that was to incorporate copyrighted material by reference, while our proposed rule would contain no copyrighted material and only contain the Vermont specific changes, as we believe this is consistent with the Second and Fifth Circuit case law on that issue. So that is the substance of the proposed rule as it's now before the committee. And um, there were two additional changes that we found in going through it. One was that a lag time regarding previous approval, previously approved projects was inconsistent with statute. And the other was regarding air tightness and ventilation standards. And we corrected, we identified both of those changes in our October 22nd and November 5th letters. Um, and so we would hope that based on these revisions that Elkar will withdraw its objection to the proposed RBS. Uh, yes, we counsel to weigh in on it. Sure, thank you. Just to repeat a lot of what Ms. Wanap already said. So to, the first time you reviewed the rule, it was like other RBS rules that had been proposed where it had a copyright in the name of the IECC. And the big picture about that issue was that a copyright on the rule itself purported to give ownership or control of a public law to a private entity. And case law had indicated that that's not appropriate because the public owns the law. So what the department has done instead with this revision is to not place a copyright on the rule. Instead, it incorporates by reference the existing RBs and then makes Vermont specific uh, uh, revisions to that, um, incorporated by reference material. 
And as one of us already indicated, the Second Circuit, of which Vermont is a member, our Federal Second Circuit Court of Appeals, has stated, has held that it's legally permissible for a rule to incorporate by reference copyrighted material, which is what this is doing. The revision does not uh, purport to pr uh, place a copyright on the rule itself. So I do think it addresses the copyright issue that Elkar had raised in its objection letter. Thank you. Are there any questions? <coughs> was it, who was it that pointed this problem out to us? Uh, Ledge Council. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Not us, that. <laughs> um, I, <clears throat> I have a question tangentially related to this. That there were, I appreciate you going through and finding the, the uh, omissions and, and correcting those. Uh, there were two other particular um, concerns about the content. Um, one was related to insulation and uh, the thin exterior insulation with a concern about that trapping vapor inside the wall and actually decaying buildings rather than preserving them. And the other was lighting, but I forget the specific um, concern, both raised by, by numerous witnesses. And I'm wondering if there's any uh, intention to go to continue to look at the policy with a critical eye or the rule with a critical eye. Absolutely. The, the, the rule itself um, is based on the IECC, as we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so the basis of it, um, we can't really uh, address. However, for Vermont specific code, we definitely feel that it's important to address that. Um, and the most important, uh, the, the way most Vermont builders interact with the code is through the code handbook. So we're putting a lot of effort into making those issues um, clear and providing guidance to builders in Vermont to prevent exactly the, the situation that was raised. Um, I'm not remembering the lighting issue. If anybody else can refresh my memory. Yeah, I would have um, to look through my notes. But I, I presume it's, it's a similar situation. If it's a technical issue, um, we'll be able to address that in the handbook, which is the primary um, uh, way that builders will uh, uh, follow the code. And that will provide clear and lay language um, to, to enable them to follow the code without um, having the building deteriorate over time. But, but the code allows this practice as one of four packages. It allows it, um, yes, correct. There are other pathways that um, um, will allow variations to those packages. Um, and uh, the, the issues of durability of the building is where we'll provide guidance in, in the handbook. And I, I don't want to keep going on this because okay. it's not the issue at hand, but I did want to raise it. Rome. Thank you. While you were here. And, and we are concerned about that. Senator yeah. Lance. Can you remind me how uh, code enforcement <clears throat> occurs? Um, that's separate from the code, and it's a legislative issue, so um, I, I don't want to. Um, uh, do we have code enforcement at all? I'll it's enforced in, through the civil code. So, in other words, at <clears> the <throat> point of sale of a building. Right. Um, it's not a title defect, but um, the, the uh, buyer is allowed to, in civil court, um, file suit if Arby's has not been met. Does that go through you, or does that go through public safety, or where does that go? What? Uh, the, it's a self-certification process, so the builder signs the certificate, and then it needs to be filed with the town and with us. Also, um, if any town that requires a certificate of occupancies, they have to submit the certificate before a certificate of occupancy is issued. So that's really the uh, main mechanism where the, the enforcement is happening. If I'm the third owner of the building and I discover that the code hasn't been met, do I still have recourse? Um, I, believe there's a there, I, I believe there's a civil 
um, action limit of is it five years, six years. Um, yeah. I don't think it um, is based on the original owner of the Google's. <laughs> Call in efficiency for long. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, any further questions, mm -hmm. Senator Beck? Just one quick question. So um, thanks for threading the needle, solving the challenge. Of the, um, but in, in, I just wanted to make sure, I think one of the things we talked about last time was copyrighted material couldn't be downloaded um, unless you had, I don't know, some membership or paid fee or something like that. So um, I'm just wondering about accessibility of the code. I know you're saying most people rely on the handbook because that's kind of a more user-friendly translation of it. Will Vermonters be able to access the full code, uh, the, the full code in some way at no charge? Yes, um, we have an agreement, a signed agreement with um, the International Code Council that we actually are gonna do an integrated um, all-in code with both the copyright language and our changes to it. And that will be available for free download, or not free download, free viewable. Yeah. Uh, we also will be purchasing um, a number of, we usually start with like a thousand of the commercial and then we print the handbooks on the residential side and provide it for free, for yeah. hard copies for free. But it will always be free viewable um, on the ICC website. And this is the same level of access that was previously available, um, just that the Vermont specific changes as they are enacted in the formal rule are separated out. So. And did we solve the challenge of having the Secretary of State's website be able to also provide access? Yes, we have an, in our agreement with ICC, it also says that we're free to post all the Vermont amendments, because there are amendments yep. on Wessex, Wessex, Essex, and on the state of um, the, the Secretary of State website. So I don't think we really need their permission because it doesn't. Um, have the copyright language on it, but just be extra sure mm -hmm. and check that box. Yep. We have it. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, I make a motion that we uh, approve the rule as a member. So it could be. Is it that or is it to withdraw our objection? I think, yeah, I think there's two motions. Oh, there's a motion sorry. first if you want to withdraw your previous <laughs> objection. I'll back up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> make a motion that we withdraw our previous objection. That's what I thought you said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Let's close say nay. And now I'd like to make the motion. The rule. That's all meant. All those in favor <clears throat> say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. And Thank you for, as Senator said, threading that needle. Uh, for those who haven't met me before, my name is Dan Whipple. I'm the Volsha Program Manager. I'd like to introduce uh, Bailey Emelo. Bailey is our um, relatively newly promoted uh, compliance supervisor. So uh, I wanted Bailey to come along to kind of get um, sort of a good look at the rules making process and things like that. So I thought that was kind of neat for her to, to come in. Welcome. So this particular rule is a modification of an existing rule um, that we had, uh, that we had um, submitted in the past number of years ago that deals with um, <clears throat> operator training and certification for crane operators. Uh, to say this has been a highly contentious uh, rule in the past nationally is um, probably an understatement. It was continually stayed by Federal OSHA because when it initially passed, um, <coughs> there weren't any, there, there were not a volume of entities that were able to provide the level of training that OSHA required um, in existence, and it took a number of years for that to happen. Um, as a result of that, and it continual stays, they, they um, they took a look at the, uh, you know, the rules, and they found uh, ways that they could streamline um, the expectations of training. One of the key ones that they that they um, were able to affect was um, the requirement for certification of operators for different types of cranes. So, um, if you had a particular type of crane, and you can imagine, you know, different uh, types of cranes, everything from 
you know, tower cranes that you see in the big cities to, uh, you know, um, hydraulic cranes, uh, lattice boom type cranes. So there's many, many different types of cranes. And the old rule, um, the old adage of the rule required that uh, not only were operators required to be certified on different types of cranes, but they're also required to be hold different certifications or separate certifications for different weight limits of cranes. So if you had, for instance, a, um, a hydraulic crane that was, um, you know, a 15 ton crane, um, which is pretty common on most job sites, uh, an operator would be required to uh, hold a certification to operate that crane. But if that, but if there were a 60 ton um, hydraulic crane, which is basically the same type of crane, it was just a different weight limit, then the operator would be required to hold a separate certification. And that was a pretty significant, um, you know, uh, encumbrance on an employer to make sure that that happened because getting a separate certification required, you know, the operator to attend a, a certified educational program and it was, you know, those are at a pretty significant cost. So the, the main crux of this rule um, actually allows um, the employer to be able to um, have one, an operator with one certification to operate the same type of crane. So if it's a hydraulic boom crane, um, no matter what the weight limit is, they would only need one certification. They would have to, they would have to uh, prove their, you know, ability to the uh, employer to operate that particular crane, but that certification would be valid for that type of crane. If it were um, a lattice boom, just another type of crane, a lattice boom crane, then that operator would have to hold the separate certification for that particular type of crane because it's a different type. Um, so by doing that, they really try to sort of st streamline the uh, um, the certification requirements and also to, to kind of make it a little easier for employers to be able to uh, to adhere to that, uh, especially in today's construction sites where, you know, there are many different sizes of the same type of cranes that are available um, depending on what the need is. Um, so that's that's basically the crux of, of this rule change. Representative Gardner. I see that ICAR recommended that you have a public hearing, but my understanding is that none was held locally and that um, there was quite a conversation federally and it was, uh, I guess, assumed that that would be um, the vehicle by which Vermonters could put their input or give input to this. Can you comment on why there was no well, there, public hearing? There was a public hearing. Um, we held it in Montpelier and there was a call-in number that was provided as well um, for Vermonters in specific. And, and in addition, we contacted uh, specific um, uh, construction groups like uh, AGC and, and, uh, and I think AGC was the primary one. I, I think we uh, put the word out for the state of Vermont uh, for VTRANS uh, in case that you know, they have cranes on their projects as well so that they could, you know, they could uh, know what sort of training records to demand of their, of their contractors. Um, federal comment is a vehicle which, um, you know, which anyone can submit comments to. Um, and that's always in place. Uh, we did have, we did have a, a public hearing. Let me see. It was, it was just not too awfully long ago. Public hearing was uh, September thirtieth, two thousand nineteen. Was our public hearing? Thank you, uh, my error, but it does say in the paperwork that I received, um, point number 19, a hearing was not held. Oh, it could be that that wasn't updated at the time that that paperwork was submitted. Um, it may have been just a, but I have in my, in my, uh, and I know I was at the public hearing, so, okay. so and I know okay. I did hold it, but so, it's, it was actually specifically 930 of 2019. And were there a number of comments? Were there any issues? No, we didn't, okay. we didn't receive any comments. Thank you. 
<coughs> Senator Bray. I just say, uh, there is um, one of the very last pages, the proposed rule posting anyway, it, there's a short summary on economic impact and there's mm -hmm. $1.7 million mm -hmm. in savings. Mm -hmm. yep. Can you say a little bit about how those savings are achieved? Well, the, um, primarily the achieving of that savings would be, and this is a federal figure, I got it from the, because uh, it would be hard for us to quantify what that means for Vermont, because, um, you know, it's hard to know exactly how many um, crane operator and, and cranes there are in Vermont. Um, but, but, they, but they figured that based on, um, the um, lack of having to resend an operator to a crane certification training, which uh, one course could cost thousands of dollars for one particular operator or a group of operators. That's, that's primarily the, if you look back in the um, filing paperwork, that's primarily how they arrived at that. Okay. So, and you don't have any concern that this will mean that operators are in some way less trained? No, in particular, I don't. Sometimes the feds will do something that I don't particularly like. Um, but I think in this, I think this actually makes sense. No. This actually does make sense. I think you know these these cranes, even though they have a different weight limit, they they operate the same way. They they use the same theory and the same mechanics, and the inspection requirements, the information, the safety requirements of these cranes are all the same, whether it's a 20-ton crane or a 100-ton crane. Um, so the theories are the same. And to, re to have to spend, you know, three or $4,000 to send somebody back to get trained on a higher weight level, when the only real difference is the higher weight level, I didn't think that made a whole lot of sense anyways. So I, I think I, I'm comfortable with it as far as an agency um, person. Thank you. Um, I have a question in the... It was in the cover material in the economic impact analysis. Um, it says uh, OSHA is obligated to adopt rules promulgated and adopted by federal OSHA. And it, are we obligated to adopt those rules or rules at least no more lenient than that? Can we adopt stricter rules? Yes, yes. And, and we could have refused to because it could be seen as um, we were more uh, by, by keeping the old rule, we would be more restrictive than uh, the federal government in, in the case of this particular rule because it, it's actually seen as uh, an easing up on employers a little bit. And we could have said, no, we're not satisfied with that and, and we're not going to adopt that. But we thought that it made sense. I mean, one area where we have uh, pushed back is uh, chemical exposures, right? So. Um, we, you know, when, when Federal OSHA back in the 1990s uh, got sued and had to, uh, you know, drop out of their adoption of uh, updated chemical exposure limits, uh, OSHA chose to keep the more restrictive exposure limits, and so we have our own exposure limits now. So there are places where we are more restrictive. And so we could have said, no, we don't want to adopt this and kept the old rule, and we would have been okay. Um, but I, but I thought when I read it over, I thought it made sense to 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 do that. I talked with my director about it, and you know we came to an agreement that it was a good thing to adopt. Because the other thing too is we want to we want to try to maintain a consistency and an even playing field for folks. Because many many employers don't only operate in Vermont; they operate out of state as well. So it's important to have that consistency for them. Senator Lyons. So you get an incident report. If there's an accident with any of these cranes, yes. Yeah, we uh, well, if the accident causes injury, injury, then they're required to okay. report it. Um, but not however, damage to the equipment. Right, not damage to the equipment. Um, most of the time, because these are so dramatic of an event, um, we'll catch wind of it. I mean, we very seldom will miss somebody dumping a crane, and we usually we'll we'll have. Couple a year, about yeah. a couple a year that we. And the media we, usually covers them as well, so if yeah. we don't get a direct report from an employer, then some outlet is reporting yeah. it and we find out. They call us. Yeah, when somebody <laughs> tips a crane over, that's a pretty. That's a it's not as bad as if it were in Boston, but but um, okay. but yeah. it's still a pretty dramatic event, and uh, 
we usually will hear about those types of things. Fire departments will be called, and we have good relationships with most fire departments. They'll say, hey, do you know somebody dumped this frame over here? And, right. Oh, thank you very much. We'll go take a look at it. But it doesn't relate to uh, fire department tower trucks and those kind of, it's really just simply cranes. Right, right, yeah. And tower, and tower trucks specifically are not cranes because they're right. personnel uh, elevating devices. Right. Well, for the record, I'm taking my work with the Department of Housing, Community Development, Community Planning and Revitalization Division. Uh, my name is Chris Cocker. I'm the Director of Community Planning and Revitalization. I'm Jacob. I'm Dale Azaria. I'm the General Counsel for the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, please tell us about this rule. Yeah, so this is a rule that uh, guides the funding for the Regional Planning Commission, so all the Regional Planning Commissions around the city been around for uh, quite a long time and we're looking and we uh, did some housekeeping or we're proposing some housekeeping uh, so that the rules reflect the current entities at first as it references the Department of Housing Community Affairs instead of the Department of Housing and Community Development. It mentions an RPC that is no longer ex in existence, the Lake Sun P region. And, uh, and we also have some administrative efficiencies that have been prepared in cooperation with the uh, Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies that represents the Regional Planning Commission, so, such as posting their audits online to increase uh, transparency. Is this, um, last year there was legislative session, there was a uh, discussion about uh, rerouting the funding for um, conservation districts through regional planning commissions. Is that part of this? Not part of this. No. This is, um, um, annually, the, the regional planning commissions get an allocation of funding from the state through the um, property transfer tracks. Um, the, word, the ACC is basically a pass through agency. Um, this governs how these monies are distributed and split among the regional planning commissions. Again, it's been on the books since forever, and this is, these are just housekeeping changes to the updated group. Any questions? Uh, Senator, <laughs> Representative <Hardy. laughs> Um I see that Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies and the Vermont League of Cities and Towns submitted comments, but were they included in this? They are. They are. They are. are. Mm -hmm. the They're right at the end of the blue. Oh, at they the end of the blue. blue. Okay. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a packing for our hearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Senator Bray. A, a quick um, question on funding. So the $2.9 million mm -hmm. is up, uh, it's allocated out to the 11, right? And then there's a note that talks about leveraging an additional $8 million. Is that federal money that's it's a mix, and that changes every year. Um, you know, some of the RPCs are more entrepreneurial, and they really hustle and get a lot of grants, um, so it's going to vary year in, year out. Some of that leverage may be you know, um, clean water funding, that could be federal funding, it could be just whatever you know opportunities that present to them. As well as the municipal that are made by the uh, whatever municipalities to the regional planning commissions. I noticed your, your hearing was convened at 11 o'clock and adjourned at 11.02. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was a short hearing with yeah. uh, one, one person. So. Yeah. We gave out numbers and everybody was really efficient. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any further questions? I move approval of 1952. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Approved 19 P52. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next rule up is 19 P65 uh, child support guidelines. No, Kyle, half of the witnesses is here. I'm working so expeditiously hard. Witnesses are trying to get yeah. there. Yeah. They're still getting their coffee. Yeah. 
just concerned about the floor and the window, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nick had a question about it. Mm -hmm. Dick Sears had a question about it. Every week. <clears throat> every week. How That's frequency. That's got to go back to his committee. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Please identify yourself for the record. I'm Kyle Hatt. I'm the Office of Trial Sports Lawyer in the Southeast Region based in Springfield. Welcome. Thank you. And, uh, please let us know what this rule, the changes to this rule do. This rule, in summary, updates the child support guidelines in two ways. The first being to update the tax conversion tables, which convert parents' monthly gross income into after-tax income and ultimately income available to potentially pay child support. The second is to update the impact family expenditures table, the table which is used at the back end of the child support guideline calculation to determine the monthly child support obligation. The main update to that part of the guideline rule is to adjust for current price levels. Um. Any no, I was just thinking, <clears throat> reflecting on going through these numbers. Not that I went through every single <laughs> number. You know, I, I went, oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, um, line 14 on page 8. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think my 14 on page 8 was a troublesome one. Yeah, you know what? Um, I did have a question. Um, and I'm. I'm don't find my the source of my note now, but um, somewhere in here I read that this the information that this analysis was based on is a decade old. The rule was last approved uh, was last modified in 2016, but the information is 10 years old. Is that really the uh, the most the best data that we have? So if you can. Okay. Try to point me to. So, are okay. you referring to the submitted proposed rule or to the the supporting report? The uh, the, su the the filing paper, filing information on the uh, the final proposed rule filing, page three, set, uh, number fourteen, the concise summary. Last line of that says. The expenditures table has been revised to reflect the most recently available detailed information on household expenditures by using the 2010 Betson Rothbart estimates. And I'm just thinking if we're using estimates nine years old, almost a decade old, um, by definition, those are out of date. I'm sorry, I'm still trying to find okay. exactly more. <coughs> I'm on page three. Page three. Page yeah. three. Yeah. The first. The bottom there line is. of the biggest paragraph. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Number 14. That's from Rothbard. So in general, for an explanation about the economic analysis that underpins the guideline updates, I would refer to you to the report of Dr. James Benor that's referenced in the same document that you just referenced. There's a detailed explanation of the economic justification for the guideline updates. And I think in particular, Page 16 is where the report itself gets into the detailed analysis of the basis for the updates. Can you say page 16? I'm not sure which one. 
page 16 of the report. So if you don't have the report in front of you, it won't be possible to for you to look at that. But so there's a the economic impact statement. No. So the general structure of the submission is that there's the proposed rule that it appears you all have in front of you, but reference in this. Yes. Yes. So there's a. It's sub nine on on our page three, and it's titled sufficiency. Actually, the second page three. Yeah, right. <laughs> <coughs> so the report is available online. I think that's the reference document that says economic impact statement. Right. In the right, that's the addendum to our. Is that right? <coughs> well, so to answer your question more for today's purposes, if you would like a detailed explanation in writing as to the freshness of the economic analysis, well, we'd be happy to follow up with you in writing about that. But the report explains that Vermont, like 26 other states, relies upon this methodology that was developed by a professor named David Betson. And this methodology, the, the measurements that, that Professor Betson did are updated periodically when he obtains funding, in essence, to do it. And the methodology we've chosen is a policy decision and the analysis we have is the most up-to-date version of that analysis. But as to the freshness of, I guess I'm not sure exactly, I'd like you to clarify your question in terms of which part of the, the 2010 aspect is potentially vested. Right. <clears throat> so the, um, so my, my concern is not with the methodology. It's, uh, Looking at the the first page three, <laughs> uh, the summary again, number fourteen. Um, it says the table has been revised to reflect the most recently available detailed information on household expenditures by using the 2010 Betts and Rothbard estimates. And my concern is, if we're using 2010 estimates, those would appear would appear to me to be badly out of date. And I'm wondering if those are really the best estimates we have. I mean, we collect economic data annually. And so I, I'm not, I don't understand why we're using estimates almost a decade. So I think, again, generally for a justification of the particular form of analysis that we've used, I've referred to the report that's referenced in the proposed rule, but I'm happy to follow up and submit a written explanation in writing about that question in particular. I think it would call for a, a written explanation. Is, is there a, an expiration date on the estimates? A sell-by date? I'm sorry? A sell-by date that you get on your package of chicken? I'm not sure it's that simple. I think that... <coughs> I don't know offhand if there's an expiration date on it, a point at which you would say that estimates that have used in the past are no longer viable. It may be that there are certain estimates are viable longer than others, depending on the kind of estimate you're talking about. I'm just wondering if perhaps the first page three has some misunderstanding of what actually is going on here. As I understand it, Dr. Van Moore was actually updating that 2010 calculation. If I'm reading her economic impact statement correctly, she was citing uh, changes to the tax tables uh, that became effective in January of 2018. And 
Mr. Chair, if I understand your initial thought there, we all got, and Kyle, I don't know if you know this, we got a note from our Senate Judiciary Chair that he thought it would be more helpful to have these looked at more frequently. Um, I'm not sure if those two issues are related the same way I think they are, but I suspect that this first page three should have said something along the lines of we're updating from the 2010 Betts and Rothbart estimates based on the changes to the tax code. I could be totally wrong in how I'm reading that, but that's the way it looks reading the economic impact statement addendum um, where the doctor is bringing us up to speed with the latest tax changes. And I understand the calculations. This entire project got sparked by the tax cuts that forced us all to take another look at how child support was being administered in the state. I don't know if I'm being helpful or Senator, I, I, I hope that's correct and maybe the 2000. Well, it does say that in the impact. Is it, it does. It's, yeah. If you read the first page of the economic impact statement, um, the up to date analysis is presented um, and it leaves me clear, with the clear impression that we're bringing it up to what was done in January of 2018. But, and, and I think that's why Dick Sears red flagged and said this is mm -hmm. something we ought to take a look at a little bit more often. But the methodology, I'm not sure the methodology changes all that much unless there is a triggering device like the changes in the tax codes where there's some economic impact across the board that people then are affected differently. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the child support calculations, if you are in a, uh, a couple that is separating and you have children, there is a presumption that X amount of your combined incomes goes for the benefit of the children. And the expectation is we try to maintain that for the benefit of the children after you have split. Um, but it essentially takes both of your gross income and files it down through this process to arrive at an expectation of what you would normally be spending uh, for the benefit of your kids. I don't think the methodology has, methodology has changed in almost 30 years now since we originally had this come down, but when you have a, a major tax cut, there is an impact on the revolving analysis. Um, I'm pretty sure that's how this all got sparked. And I, I'm reading the economic impact statement to say we're now bringing that up to speed from the last time we examined this back in 2010. Looks like we have some clarification, perhaps. Uh, yeah, so. I'm, so I'm Sarah Hazel, I'm the managing attorney. I think. Um, to Kyle's point, I think that you're right, Senator Benning. The methodology has not changed. And um, Dr. Venor's report in detail, and I think as Kyle has said, we're happy to go through the report and, and cite exactly how, but Dr. Venor's report speaks to why that methodology is still sound. But essentially, we're employing that methodology, as Senator Benning indicates, to update the 2009 tax tables that were implicated because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And I, I would say, in terms of Senator Sears' um, concern, the, so statutorily, the guidelines are reviewed quadrennially. As an aside, um, as a result of the passage of the Vermont Parentage Act, we know that we're going to have to be looking through some, um, specifically some, some guidelines implications that have resulted because of the passage of the act. So I do think we will be looking at the guidelines sort of more pervasively throughout the next couple of legislative sessions because of the act. But put on um, pursuant to statute, they are quadrennially and currently. Senator oh, Lyons. I have a uh, Les Council question. So, given that, and uh, is there anything in our statutes, uh, maybe APA, that says that there are conditions under which rules will be reviewed more frequently than um, statute allows? Or is it only? Well, I think you look at both the APA and the specific enabling law in this case. As and this one is every four years, but, but is it also there anything that sort of 
Yeah, right. um, well, specifically, this enabling law says the secretary may amend the guideline from time to time as may be necessary, but not less than once every four years. So there's already there's flexibility there. built into that. So, so the Senator Sears' concern is is covered as long as the the department is aware, right? You know, that you're doing. Okay, so so it, it sounds like it may be a misunderstanding mm -hmm. on, on my part about methodology versus data. And, and if you could clarify just Well, a, I think that, so there, uh, again, there's two main things going on. One is updating, as Senator Benning said, the tax conversion tables based upon uh, changes to the federal tax code and incorporating Vermont's response to that as well, but also updating the, the intact family expenditures tables, which as to, to speak to what Senator Benning said, the, the underlying methodology for that is not something that's new, and the justification for relying upon the data that is relied upon um, to update that table is explaining in detail of the report. Representative Myers. What it strikes me as is that if we're talking about the 2010 Betson Rothbard estimates, that's to me. That means that somebody sat down, Mr. Betson Rothbaum sat down and said, this is the method by which we should compute how the, how the money should be distributed. If it, if it happened in 2010, if it happened in, in 1900, but the method is always the same, th what this does now is it brings it up to all tax issues that are, that are current and puts it in, the method puts it into the numbers, but that doesn't have anything to do with the numbers that were in existence in 2010. At least that's how I'm looking at it. Based on, on doing it that way, you, 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 you sure. adjust it periodically. There is a, pro so the underlying methodology, the Betts and Rothbard <laughs> methodology is not a new methodology and the analysis done as to that part of the update is meant to update the intact family expenditures table using the most current, current numbers. numbers available that would be used in that analysis. And that analysis is explained in detail starting on page 9 of the, of the supporting report by Dr. Benoit. Thank you. I'm going to take a lash at that horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you came up with an analysis in 2010, um, the average income in the United States has changed in a way that had not changed previous to that, and the median income has changed in a way that it had not changed in the previous few years. So an analysis based on I just don't know how an analysis based on, on th that's those sort of numbers is relevant when the changes that have taken place were ones that were not predicted and we were told, you know, we believed would not go in the directions that they've gone. So I, I, I mean, if you... Well, so I think that, again, yeah, I refer to the report, if you would like us to follow up with a detailed written explanation of why the use of the economic data that's used in the estimates is pertinent currently. We're happy to provide that. I think, as Kyle indicated, this is this this methodology is something that 26 other states are utilizing when calculating their their child support obligations. I think I, I would appreciate that letter because I'm unclear what is the. So if the methodology dates back to 2010, what is, what is the date of the current economic data that we're putting into that calculus? Is that okay. <coughs> well, Sherry, can I ask you? Senator Bragg. Procedural, are we asking to postpone action prior to, so that we can receive that report prior to uh, approving or not the rule? Is that what you're... Where you're headed? I'm not sure what where exactly where I'm headed with this. Well, I was just looking at the 45-day review period on our sheet. So it's 
Oh. And that's Thanksgiving. And so I'm just thinking about timing. What ha if we delay action in order to receive a report? Other th we make we need to make other adjustments. As well. So, so I I am not asking for a delay because it, it appears to me that it's, a, I'm asking for a clarification. Okay. And I think that will allay my concerns. And, and the, 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 uh, the concern that was expressed by Senator Sears has been, from, at least from my perspective, adequately addressed. So, um, and Representative Grad has approved, said it's consistent. So I'm, I'm fine with where we are. I do think having that information so we better understand um, what's here would be helpful. Representative Gardner. Just one quick question for my own knowledge. So are you saying basically that the Betts and Rothbard estimates are basically a formula? So what the, this, you know, page nine of this report that I keep talking about, um, there's an explanation of what uh, Dr. Betson's analysis is, uh, the Betts and Rothbard analysis. It's essentially looks at a comparison of expenditures on a certain thing, which would happen to be adult clothing um, in the Rothbart um, version of this methodology. And it looks at families who have children and families who don't. And it looks at um, the difference between the amount of money spent on adult clothing in, in those two scenarios, and presumes that the difference is attributable to uh, expenditures for children. And uses that as a way of assessing how much a family that's intact will spend on children. And that is the way in which Vermont, along with other states, develops this table, the intact family expenditures table, to figure out how much, assuming at a certain income level, or once you get to a certain income level through the, the tax conversion process and other factors, you look at the table and say a family at that income level will spend that amount of money on children per month, and then that is, in essence, how you get to the monthly child support obligation. So that's a summary of what this Betts and Rothbard analysis is. It's a way of calculating how much an intact family will spend on children once you've determined that family's income level. So any data could be inputted into it, any current uh, numbers? Data regarding what specifically? Clothing. It's based on the current after-tax conversion rates, based on the 2019. You're basing it on current rates. Yeah, right. Yes. The, 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 available, the income available for support is based upon the current tax structure, federally and in, in, in state. So there's two aspects of the guideline calculation before you figure out if a person has the ability to pay. One is to figure out the income available to pay child support. And then you take that information and you then use the intact family expenditures table to determine what the monthly support amount payable will be. And so the first part of that is updated, and as Senator Benning spoke about, it's updated to incorporate changes to the federal and state tax law. And that is um, the information that's current um, based upon the current tax law. Senator McDonald. So in your Explanation of clothing is one of a whole list of percentages that are calculated. So this is this is addressed in the, again Dr. Venor's uh, report, but their economists have different ways of trying to assess um, child rearing costs. One methodology, and this is the one that's um, obviously the one that Dr. Betson and, and the Betson Rothbart uh, analysis employs, uses expenditures on adult clothing as a way of getting to that issue. Another um, methodology alone? So that methodology uses that as a proxy as I understand it. And so if you, there's another study that's referenced where it talks about um, expenditures on food as a way of, of um, getting at child expenditures. And so there's an analysis, there's a discussion of which of, of the justification for using that that's in the report. Um, starting on page nine. And so there's different ways of getting at this question that, econ that economists uh, can use. And this is the methodology that Vermont's um, sure. used for a long time and that other states use. 
All right. It's, it's more accurate than the iPhone analysis. <laughs> no, I, I would assume that someone has come up with the pie, and it includes rent and clothing and heat and electricity and and, um, yeah. and food and various things, and that's what is generally to believe to be the case. Um, what was the case in 2010, as median incomes have fallen, is that the, the slices of the pie are different than they used to be. And is you know, are we going to continue to use the, the unless I, I'm off on the wrong track, are we going to continue, how long are we going to continue to use the slices of a pie um, nine, nine years ago as the Great Recession was still in effect? So. I, I think that the, the, the most, well, as the report references, the most, and I'm actually quoting from this now, the most recent Betts and Rothbard BR measurements were produced in 2010 are based on the 2004-2009 CES. So the, the Dr. Venor is relying upon the most recently obtained data that employs this Betts and Rothbard analysis. So I would assume that if this was updated in the future and there was an updated analysis done at that time, then it would use the, the most current analysis available at that time. So I think that, again, the, the studies that undergird these analyses are, are updated themselves periodically, and we would use the most updated version of those supporting analyses that we had available to us. Senator Bennett. So Mark, just to try to answer your question, according to Dr. Nor's impact statement, Price levels have increased 8.3% since the existing guidelines table was developed. I am assuming she took into account all of the questions, from clothing to everything else. Kyle, I'll ask you directly, has this new rule taken into account her statement for the purpose of developing these new guidelines? The updates to the tax conversion tables and the intact family expenditures tables are based upon Dr. Lenore's analysis. Okay. She also goes on to say the elimination of the personal exemption for minor children and an increase to the child tax credit since, well, it looks like December 2017 became effective January 1. Those were the changes to the federal tax code that resulted in changes to our tax code, if I understand that correctly. Yes. Your new guidelines take into account that as well? Yes. Okay. The only other thing that's out there is um, she notes that originally the intact family expenditures were uh, given a maximum combined available income of 25000 That's been increased to 30000 Yes. The current tables have taken that into account as well. Yes. And so another aspect, I was summarizing the update to the tax conversion tables, but another aspect of what is being done this time around is that the the tax conversion tables will now be extrapolated up to thirty thousand a monthly income of thirty thousand dollars per month, whereas before I think the, the cap was twenty twenty five. You are now also <coughs> examining this every four years. Is that correct? So as uh, Attorney Houseman mentioned, this, so that in, in, as discussed before, there's a statute that requires it to be done at least every four years. Um, the, as you spoke to, there was this, the tax changes spurred, uh, in a sense, um, the updating this time around. But again, I think the last time they were updated was in 2015, so we were okay. due for an update. Um, I think in part the, the quadrennial updating is, is rooted in federal law as well in the, the Dr. Benor's report also speaks to the federal regulations which require a host of considerations to be taken into account when updating guidelines to ensure, in essence, I think what, what you're getting at, that there's different economic factors that are relevant in, in trying to figure out whether ultimately a child support guideline amount is representative of what families are, are spending on children and represent current everyday lives of, of parents. So the, the economic report that Dr. Fenor prepared goes into detail about the, the analysis she did and how it complies with the federal requirements for ensuring that, that in essence, what you're getting at is whether these child support guidelines are reflecting the reality of what it costs to raise children. And I think the report really goes into detail about that. So Mr. Chair, report written since 
2010? Yes, this is a report, the date of which is June 14th, 2019. So, Mr. Chair, given that there are a heck of a lot of family court cases out there now pending that are going to be um, using these guidelines as their cases move forward, I'm going to move and we approve the rule, uh, there may be questions that the chair or anybody else wants to have answered, and I have no problem with that, but the rule itself I don't find any reason for us to be objecting based on what we have now, so I would move the proof. Representative Myers had a no, question I, before. That's right. fine. Okay. <clears throat> Senator McDonald. I wrote a, a, a question to the attorney about whether or not uh, Senator Sears's concerns would, could be addressed by emergency rules um, if it turned out that things were changing faster than the, the department was likely to able to calculate and your response was uh, perhaps because <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, emergency, the emergency rule statute says that an agency may adopt an emergency rule if it finds that there's an imminent peril to public health safety or welfare um, so that is a, uh, every agency's emergency rulemaking authority um, if the agency found that there was such an imminent peril, it could adopt an emergency rule. Otherwise, as already discussed, um, the agency already has the ability to go through the standard rulemaking process as may be necessary, um, aside from the four-year requirement to update these rules. Maybe uh, we could ask him directly whether he was aware they were updating every four years, because I think that might answer the question. Okay. So I, I would agree that um, in the event that things are changing faster than they, yeah. then the agency might be prepared to, to or be able to solve the, the opportunity there is to deal with it in a more expedited fashion. You'd be prepared to respond, Julie, to emergent peril. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are no further comments or questions, we have a motion on the table to approve the rule as presented. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Thank you for waiting through this one. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. All right. So do you want me to uh, please you? identify yourself for the record? Sure. And then, yeah. yeah, Scott Davidson, Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, I serve as the uh, Chief Inspector for the Enforcement and Safety Unit. Uh, what you uh, have here today uh, from us is a combination of two things. One is we were in front of you last year uh, making manual changes, and as you know, we took a 547 free booklet inspection manual and made it 162 page document. We made a lot of changes. Uh, and in doing so, we missed a couple of things that uh, we're just here to clean up to make sure that uh, we get back on track with it. And then the other uh, area that uh, we are looking to uh, to make some changes with is with the passage of H-529 last year, it modified the language for admissions to vehicles 16 years uh, and older being exempt from OBD testing. So therefore, we had to update the manual to reflect those changes as directed in H-529. Uh, so those were the, the changes. Uh, so the first one was on page 53. Uh, and with that, uh, we adopted and changed the language to reflect the 16-year exemption. Uh, and uh, with that language that we put in the, uh, the periodic inspection manual, we worked with Megan O'Toole, attorney and staff for Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, and as you can see, it's almost word for word out of 529. Um, and uh, that's what we did there. Page 55 uh, dealt with home uh, built vehicles, also was affected by the language um, in references 1996 to agree with the 16 year exemption. Page 97, um, exterior sun visor removed as uh, it is not addressed in federal regulations. This is one of those interesting ones that at the end of doing a year long process that when you read, you scratch your head. Um, Interestingly enough, we removed it uh, because it's in conflict with federal regulation. So federal regulation does not prohibit um, the sun visor. 
So I tried to figure out where our team came up with the language. Uh, and uh, after much to do, I realized that that language that we had in there came from the Canadian Federal Motor Vehicle Carrier. So I wonder if when going through the process, uh, somebody put that in there as as a suggestion and somehow it, it stayed in there through amendment. But that it's actually Canadian Federal Motor Carrier Law. It is not um, USA Federal uh, Law. So we made the changes to reflect uh, current federal regulation. Page 111. Inspection of wheels and tires was inadvertently uh, admitted from the trailer section. So what happened here is in order to shorten the manual, streamline it, and to make it more readable, we eliminated the redundancy. So in many of the sections, the criteria was the same as it was in car and truck, as it was in motorcycle, as it was in trailer, as it was. So what we said was, we're pleased refer to car and truck criteria on this, and somehow that one line, that one sentence got omitted from trailers, which means there is no tire standards currently in the manual for tires because that reference was not sent back to car and truck. So by adding one sentence when they inspect a trailer tire, it's the same criteria as it would be for a pleasure car or truck. So we're just referring the reader back to that criteria. And uh, page 112, again, to be consistent with federal regulation, 49 CFR uh, 293.11, um, the wording for length um, of the trailer in here from 40 feet to, uh, from uh, it added then 30 feet to be consistent again with federal regulation. So again, we wanted to make sure that we were consistent with federal regulation uh, and that was uh, discovered post, um, post this process. And uh, the last one on page 148, uh, the numbering was just off, we changed it to just added it. So those were the changes that uh, that we recommended for this modification, and why we're here today. Senator Bray, I have an uh, information question. Sure. Uh, it comes from constituents. We're just talking about tires. Are tires allowed to project outside of a view well? No, they are not supposed to. No, that's why you see a lot of the vehicles that have the extenders on them. In fact. Uh, one of my best friends is a state trooper. He's got a big Chevy truck, and he wanted to get the big fancy tires so we could sit up higher because that's the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd, the fender extenders just go above it, and he had those installed, so he's in compliance. Thank you. Hmm. The, uh, Representative Gardner. Uh, how much advance notice do the inspection stations receive when there is a rule change or a change in the inspection manual? As soon as we get them. <laughs> I literally write the bulletin almost immediately thereafter and send it out. And in this case, um, most of these bulletins have already been written advising um, our folks of, uh, of changes. Um, so for example, when 529 came out, and that went into effect immediately on July 1st, I've already done a bulletin on that. So the changes in the manual today, that manuals, that bulletin's already gone out. Um, the omission of the trailer section, I sent a bulletin out letting folks know that that was an oversight and it would be rectified in this APA process. So a lot of this has already gone out. I probably won't send anything out about the numeric number two instead of a one. I probably um, will update on the trailer length and will update on wheels and tires uh, that it's this has been passed and, and send out another bulletin. But it's usually done quite Quite quickly, quite efficiently. Yes. Um, so the July 1st changes, yep. when did you notify the inspection station? Uh, so when I had approval to do so. And that would have was been? Was the passage and effectiveness on the bill. So I think I probably would have sent it out, uh, if I remember right, the end of June <laughs> for the July 1st change. So, okay. so we're, Senator McDonald, we're approving the rules that. Ex post facto. Did, did you send out already? Yeah. Well, not for rule change, but for legislative change. Legislative. Yeah. I was for everything on this list from here down. They haven't. Um, I just notified them of what we had found in the manual. Be aware of it. That type of thing, and that we're going through the APA process for approval. But 529, that went out immediately because that law became in effect July first. 
so I'm probably going to editorialize. We're, you know, some external sun visors probably had their heyday between 1947 and 1943, and we're dealing with them here in Elkhart, but, um, and fender extenders perhaps. But when it came to the, um, the inspection of motor vehicles and just switching over to requiring the inspectors to buy computers and all that kind of stuff that never came here. Yeah. Um, how does, that strikes me as, un, how did such a thing come to pass? Yeah, that was just prior to, to me being in this position. Um, I started in April of uh, 2017, so we were about four months into the ABIT um, process. So I'm not aware of uh, what they did legislatively prior to to me being in this position with regards to that. That would have occurred in the end of 2016 um, prior to um, ABIP taking effect on July, January 1st, 2017. That would have been under uh, Commissioner Hyde and, and Director, um, I guess that would have been un unbuttoned then, yeah. You're the only person I have to beat up on. So. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, uh, so you're you're, you're <laughs> Yeah. I I, uh, I I'm pretty proud of the program and where it's gone. And considering the amount of change that we have undergone in the last three years, um, I'm, I'm really impressed at, at where it has gone and where it continues to go. Because we still intend to continue to modernize this program moving forward, which I'm excited about. Um, really ultimately just bringing the inspection program in the state of Vermont into 2019. I mean, prior to 2017, we were probably doing the same policies and procedures that we were in 1939 when we started it. So to see the amount of progress and, and forward movement and updating the manual and updating the way we collect data and how, just updating the way we are able to disseminate and communicate, um, uh, as Representative Gardner mentioned earlier, you asked him when we notify. I have multiple ways now to communicate with our inspection stations. I can communicate through tablet messaging, email. Prior to that, we stuffed envelopes and sent mail. Um, so this is big, um, you know, for us to be able to do this and to be able to report back data, collect data. Um, we have triggers set up. It helps with investigations. It helps with fraud. It helps with. Uh, helping stations that helped us with crafting the manual and what should be the priority sections to look at. A lot of benefits have come out of this program and, and we continue to benefit as a result. Understanding that, that a lot of, you know, tires and return signals and things like that yeah. are, are universal. Um, do you foresee significant changes with the anticipated uh, increase in electric vehicles and, and hybrids. In electric vehicles? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, interestingly enough, when we redid the, the, the periodic inspection manual, it's funny when you, you go through and you read it, and I came from the outside moving to DMV, and, and I read through this manual, and even not having been there, I looked at this going, there's nothing in here about ADOS, adaptive control systems. There's nothing in here about uh, lane-changing monitors, and we don't even have anything about modern vehicles in here. Um, so this first stab at this manual introduced that for the first time. So we're going to continually evolve with electric vehicles. We're going to continually evolve um, the manual. I, I'm one to keep up on it. Um, and I'm sure I'll be back here at some point um, with a lot more discussion on electric vehicles as they continue to progress. Um, I'm amazed every day if you've ever had an opportunity to drive a Tesla and the amount of power and acceleration that electric vehicles have now, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the technology is amazing. Um, so we will definitely be back here at some point um, modernizing and updating, and well, especially when we get to um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, that will be a whole other dialogue when we sit here. Um, you talk about the, the chicken or the egg for a couple first couple right? days. Because seriously, if you just think about something simple, like a car gets into a wreck, right, and goes off the side of the road, it's an autonomous vehicle. Is the operator, who's not really operating the vehicle, responsible? Is it the manufacturer who built the vehicle? Um, who's responsible for that crash? Um, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to be sitting here and discussing in the next decade or two regarding vehicles. 
member of the committee. I hope the discussion will take place in the committees of jurisdiction um, before they come to us. Yes. Which wasn't. Oh. Before they come to us. Any further questions for this witness? If not, I'll move approval. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. And you <coughs> approved 1963. <coughs> thank you very much. No, thank you. <clears throat> before adjournment, Senator Benny, you have a I question? did. Um, for those of you that don't know, Vermont has a motor vehicle racing commission. And the racing commission has rules that talk about various things, but the rule I want to talk about right now is involving demo derbies. Um, the rules require a setback, and until very recently, the setback, which the fair associations believe was established for places like Thunder Road, um, was not enforced. And suddenly, a new group of inspectors has come along to mm -hmm. seek to enforce them. I am quoting the information now that I received from Dick Lawrence, who's the head of the Caledonia County Fair, and from Jackie Folsom, who's, I believe, head of the Fair Association. They are alarmed because if the new interpretation of setbacks is enforced, five fairs will be forced to eliminate their demo derby, which is one of the big fundraisers for these fairs. Um, that's as far as I know right now, but the reason that I'm bringing this up is I understand Elcar has the ability to call up a rule and have conversation about it. Um, there are two ways of attacking this. The long way would be through statute, but unfortunately that takes so much time that we could very much have a a big problem come fair season. Um, the other way is to have Elcar take a, a quick look and see if there isn't something we can do about it to bring parties to the table and have a conversation. What I would like to be able to do is call up the rule, um, invite the Secretary of State's office, who is now in charge of inspecting um, these facilities, and the Fair Association to let them have a conversation in front of us about the impact of the new way this is being interpreted. Um, if there is a reason to have a rule change, um, I believe we have the power to ask that that is looked into. Um, and if that is not the way to go, we obviously have the statutory way, but um, this apparently is causing a lot of consternation with the Fair Association, and they've requested that I bring that to Elkar's attention. I learned about all this yesterday, just so you know. Can, can I ask a, a question? So when you talk about setbacks, is it a very specific number that's in statute? It's not in statute as I understand it. I understand it's in the rule. Only in the rule. Uh, that's my understanding, but I, I don't want to be it? confirmed on that. I asked that question and was told that, okay. and I have not looked at the statute to confirm okay. it that. So we don't, you know, we don't know what the statute said. It would be interesting to, to see how that. Yeah. Um, just so you know, the Caledonia County uh -huh. Fair had its grandstand burned down about 15 years ago. It was arsoned. Um, they rebuilt the grandstand using what was the understood setback requirements for their demo at the time. And nobody has complained about it until recently. And this is a situation where fairs would literally have to move their grandstands in order to accommodate the setback requirements that are now being enforced by the Secretary of State's office. So, so the setback is between the track and the grandstand. Not, right. not between the facility and the and neighbor. Yeah, and there's no grandfathering for these institutions that um, have been doing this for decades. The other part of that, um, if you, 
if you follow the logic of why the setback requirements are there, it makes sense if you're flying around the track at 60, 70 miles an hour, which is Thunder Road, but when you can't even get up to eight miles an hour in a demo derby, that demo does derbies. not necessarily <laughs> translate properly. And as far as I know, there has never been anybody injured in any oh, kind of a situation that, and I could be wrong there, but I've never heard of any track being sued as a result of a demo derby incident. Um, but it is alarming. They've asked me to bring it to the attention of this body, and that's what I'm doing, and hope that we can um, schedule something and have a conversation, let them know their differences, and see what we can do about it, if anything. It seems to me that given where we are before the session, that it sounds like a dual track, I, you know, committees of jurisdiction. Fairs are in institutions? They are. Oh. So could have a dual track? Investigation. No pun intended. Huh? Oh, sorry. <laughs> pun intended. Good, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just a question. So, uh, um, what? Did something happen that precipitated this different interpretation of the regulations? Yeah, the Secretary of State's office, I understand it, is now in charge of the inspections, and a new group of inspectors mm -hmm. came in and decided to enforce what they see as black and white. Um, that had never been an issue up until very recently right. when these inspectors came by, and that's why everybody's up in the Thanks, So there's no provision for just putting hay bales along the front of the grass? There, there actually is requirements for that in the rule itself, and um, that's not part of the issue because that's what these groups are doing now. But it's the setback requirement specifically <coughs> from where the track ends to where the grandstand begins that is causing them all kinds of consternation. Um, several of them just don't have the ability to move the demo derby to some other location, and the, uh, the groups, they can't simply pick up the grandstand and move it somewhere else. I don't know if it's a subject worthy of consideration, but that's my request. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? I guess I need to know what the statute says and then what the interpretation is, you know, before you start a whole process with LCAR. Well, I'm looking at what I think might be the safety standard in statute. It's in Title 26, it's 26 BSA 4811 um, at the end of sub 1. It, what I'm reading is the outside portion of all tracks shall be a reasonable distance from the spectators. And then this chapter for the Racing Commission does grant the authority um, to the director of OPR to adopt rules um, in accordance with the chapter. So I, I, if I'm reading this correctly, I don't think statute addresses the distance um, between the track, just reasonable distance, and then it, um, I'm not familiar with the rules, but I'm inferring that the rules then provide details about what is a reasonable distance. Well, the rule says, and this is 5.1.7b, a fence shall be placed not closer than 30 feet to the barrier of required above and must restrain spectators. Inadequate barriers or spectator fences will be caused for the commission to prevent the event from taking place until such time as proper barriers or fences are in place. Um, that's the primary obstacle. 30 feet. 30 feet. But half the, more than half the track. What's the, what's the distance for the for, uh, septic from a property line? Uh, <laughs> 25 or 20? Uh, it used to be 15, right? Yeah, it's pretty low. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I'll, I'll be happy to make that comparison. <laughs> 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 I just try to think of setbacks, right? Is, is there a distance between the fences? Are they use? I mean, I can see why they would require the 30 feet for like Thunder Road, but it, it, yeah, I, it's just I don't understand the difference be, that. They're suddenly using it for demo derby now. I don't know where that where did that come from, Secretary of State's office. But 
Did we see that here? No. Well, I, that, this is why I think before we start getting into you know the rule change piece that some testimony ought to be taken. Maybe it's here, but maybe mm -hmm. I think committees of jurisdiction. Uh, and what are other states doing? We don't know that. So I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking. Totally. The process and timelines. Yeah. And if we're looking at state fairs, which start in August, um, and if it's a rule, well, rule that change, change that months. has to that could be eight months. But if a statute passes, that supersedes any rule that's in place. Right. Do we have the power to? Um, <laughs> so even sending a letter to OPR to say um, we'd like to have committees of jurisdiction wrestle with this conundrum uh, prior to specific enforcement. I I don't know. I'm uncomfortable because yeah. OPR has suddenly stepped in and decided to enforce something that may have been on the books for a very long time, uh, but nobody ever raised any squawk about it. And so I'm, I'm trying to scope out in my own head what the smartest and easiest way to relieve the pressure in order to give appropriate time for even communities of jurisdiction to have a conversation. I don't know. Well, statute says that LCAR can raise issues with committees of jurisdiction. I don't think anything would stop this committee from raising an issue outside of committees of jurisdiction. Other um, letters you've sent to committees of jurisdiction, you've CC'd the relevant agency as well. Let's do, Let's do that. Let's do that. And can we send them letters <laughs> weekly? Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the distance this week? Um, just trying to think of how that letter would be drafted. That would alleviate some of the pressure while the committees get hold of it. Does uh, OPR have the authority to grant uh, waivers to their rules? They can write rules. Wow. A rule could include a waiver. I don't know. The question is whether the rule is reasonable. Right. And that's I mean, the statute mm -hmm. is calling for reasonableness. And, I'm interpreting this rule as not being reasonable, so do I attack that through the legislative process or through LCAR? Yes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, you might also give Senator White a call, since OPR is often in their box, so maybe conversation with her would be helpful just in terms of a strategy. I'm happy to do that, but I don't want to pass up the opportunity to do something concrete yeah. in the meantime if I can. Yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I, mean, I think that's a great idea, but I think if, if we write a letter to committees of jurisdiction, that would include uh, GovOps, and it would include both House and Senate, and then a CC to uh, Secretary of State. I mean, we can think, I, I, I need some more time to think about what makes sense in terms of gathering data here versus having the committees do that work. But So as a first step, we could send, yes. if, if we sent letters right. to committees and of jurisdiction. I, I think, I think that we're, I think are. based on what Senator Betting has brought us, that we are seriously considering uh, evaluating the new rule, how it was promulgated. Would you envision a statutory change, though, that specifically calls for a given setback requirements? That's the conundrum. Mm. Yeah. And the demo derby is not a high speed. Right. 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 So if they're not distinguishing between a different type of motor vehicle events, then uh, it doesn't seem that it's nuanced enough for what or goes on. Statute. Any idea when the fairs start planning their events? They're in the planning stages yeah. now. The day the after the fair ends. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the welding and the 
grinders for an operation and garages for a mm -hmm. split rail fence. Picks up after hunting season. So I, I will move to send letters to the committees of jurisdiction and the Secretary of State's office, or OPR, um, expressing our concern and our desire to see this matter taken up and resolved, because that doesn't preclude any other, any further action. Is there um, a date of start for implementation? Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, so this is a, I'm trying to figure this out. Is this a new rule? No, or it's, no. it's an old rule. It's just the old it's just rule. never enforced. And now it's an enforcement issue. Yeah. And so, I believe it's an enforcement old. issue because new inspectors right. have shown up and have decided to enforce, enforce. The black and white. And there's nothing in statute about, um, uh, as someone said, the distinction between the type of event. That's definitely a legislative something. Okay. And from what I'm reading in statute, it doesn't address any distinctions in the types of races. Mm -hmm. And then in a separate portion of the statute, um, the permit commission uh, conditions that are issued um, are to detail the way those state safety standards that are described in statute, the reasonable distance, and in rule are to be implemented. Um, huh. So. It seems like perhaps there's also some issue, um, maybe with the specifics and the permit that was issued for the demo derby. Yeah, I just, uh, if the statute says reasonable, then we've essentially ceded the discussion over to whoever is producing the rule. Mm -hmm. And if the rule is not, if the rule is imposing a condition on entities that they cannot live with, seems to me that conversation comes back here, not to the Committee of Jurisdiction, unless we're going to override the statement about being reasonable and come up with specific guidelines. And I, except I struggle to the, how we do that. Except to the extent that it is uh, contrary to legislative intent. I, I, I'd like to know. Uh, how do we determine, uh, you know, other than uh, the negative impact on those institutions, how do we determine whether that's not reasonable or not? Well, I compare comparison with what other states are doing, what, what, what are the places have in place. I mean, look at Daytona 500 and you've got people standing on the rails. Mm -hmm. That's not a setback. Or you go Indianapolis 500, everybody's sitting right there in their blankets, right? <laughs> this <laughs> this may, may have been... <clears throat> prompted by the accident at Thunder Road last summer where a, yes. a vehicle mm -hmm. careened and went up into the stands and yeah. um, caused some serious injuries that canceled the rest of the car and immediately the place was closed and, and fortunately sure. the, the, the people that were injured are, are with us, remain with us, but it was pretty scary. So, But there's a difference between uh, Thunder Road mm -hmm. and no, Demolition Dirt. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, there yeah. is. And the velocity I, of the vehicle's load is... No question about it, and but that's perhaps why it's before yeah. us today. It, it, it's, it does, I don't think it's a whim of the... It's come to us by whim. It, it's perhaps a reaction to that, and that's maybe. only my speculation. So, 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 so maybe it's a good idea. The letters might... You know, I, I, I would, if you're seeking a, recommend, a, a, a motion to I send I, the letters, I, I, I would... Made it. Yeah. But, but also, I, I think maybe uh, uh, rather than bring the whole ball of wax in here, why don't we invite the Secretary of State and, uh, and those who are enforcing the rule to talk about how that uh, occurred? It was at the Thunder Road event, and do they consider dis differences between types of races? Uh, maybe that is something we could ask about, just so we get some clarity on, on the rule and the enforcement of the rule. I, I would very much like to see that happen just so that the Fair Association gets the feeling like there's something moving. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and at least the Secretary of State's office is on notice that we've seen this and want to deal with it somehow. Um, I would love to be able to have the Fair Association be given five minutes just to have an explanation of what the actual impact of that enforcement would be on them. I don't think this needs to take a great deal of time, but if we carve out 15 minutes from a meeting and let them all come in and have a conversation, it would make me feel like 
I've actually accomplished something for them. Um, I think in the long run, I'm betting my bottom dollar, it's going to end up back in here anyway because they have to draft a rule that's going to meet the legislative intent of what is reasonable. And uh, maybe they think 30 feet is reasonable. And that's in us raising, we, we have the authority to raise an issue on our own, and <clears throat> which, so what, so what, we can't change a rule, we can invite parties in to discuss it as, as mentioned. Yes, your authority in the APA is um, to, you're able to conduct public hearings, object, and file objections concerning existing rules. So I would read the invite to OPR and the Fair Association as part of your authority to conduct hearings on existing rules. That was my understanding, and that would be my request to at least... With, with the potential to ob object? You could, you could object to an existing rule. Mm -hmm. And we will send a letter anyway, right? Is that still on the table to send the letter to committees of jurisdiction? I, well, I, I made a motion, so it's yeah. still yeah. on the table. Mm -hmm. Motion on the table. Um, is that still where you want to go? Uh, with this? We might change our minds after we hear from the folks. We, and they, we might. Yeah. I will withdraw my motion. <laughs> Do you like and one of the members of the committee to offer it? Uh, well, I'm wondering whether we should have people in here and then see what a prudent course of action yeah. is. Yeah. So as, as long as it's short, I, you know, I don't think we need yeah. to have the whole. No, I, I'm, yeah. I'm talking 15 minutes. Give yeah. Yeah. Okay. OPR a chance to explain why they feel it's reasonable, and the Fair Association to say why they feel it's not, and uh, we can act accordingly after that. Well, a moment ago you said five yeah. minutes, and that's 20 laps of thunder. No, I said so, the fair is so, so <laughs> 15 minutes, minutes is 60 <laughs> laps of thunder. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'll go with the head. <laughs> One lap. Uh, and just want to say, with Senator McDonald also has a follow up issue to raise after this. So, um, how about I, I will entertain a motion to invite parties in? to discuss. So moved. What he said. Okay. <laughs> uh, all those at, at our next scheduled meeting? Uh, all those in favor, okay. say aye. 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 And those opposed, say nay. And when is our next scheduled meeting for December 4th? Let's see, it's part five of the Motor Vehicle Commission December 4th? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I may be problematic. I'm having some eye surgery, so we'll just see how that goes. Okay, Senator McDonald. So, um, I spoke with uh, uh, David Englander at the uh, Department of Health, and he's uh, He's assured me if the Department of Health were to undertake the rules, they would do it in good rules having to do with rabies and inspections and and um, quarantining of animals, that they would do it with good faith and follow through. But he, my my fault um, that he's he's working on it, but um, it was my fault that I didn't get to it in a timely fashion. So Senator Alliance and I will perhaps continue to keep our bill request in there. And, if the department were to come back to us before the next meeting and say they'd like to tackle the rules, then I think we would go on what the <coughs> committee recommended. So that's the beginning and end of my presentation. Apologies for not having that wrapped up by today. Any <coughs> other issues or discussion? If not, I'll move adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed?